So listen, what a treat it is to be here to celebrate the launch of uh, Fred Sharman's uh, fantastic book, Space Settlements, which we've recently published and are absolutely uh, thrilled about. I'm not going to be saying anything about the book itself, um, since Fred will be doing uh, exactly that. But I would just like to say that working with Fred on the book has certainly been one of the most gratifying collaborations uh, that we've had in the publications office. <clears throat> It's a book that shows, among many other things, uh, how our imagination of space is always a reflection of terrestrial concerns, um, environment, uh, urbanization, political economy, culture, um, and architectural discourse itself, among many other things. Uh, Fred is a deeply compelling thinker and connects an incredible array of ideas, buildings, and actors of various species in his writings uh, here and elsewhere. And the archive of imagery that he's assembled in this book um, is a, a stellar project um, in and of itself. So I'd like to, yes, thank you, you gave me that. Yeah, that's you, stellar was for you. So I'd like to briefly acknowledge uh, some of the folks involved on our end. Uh, Jesse Connick was instrumental in the editing process um, in our team. Uh, uh, Jose Luis Villanueva um, and Amon Ng <coughs> did uh, such a fantastic job of tracking down um, images. And of course, Scott Vanderzee, uh, who is, where'd you go? There he is. Uh, did such a fantastic job of uh, uh, channeling these materials into a brilliant uh, book design and also produced the amazing uh, posters that you see outside. But back to Fred. Uh, Fred teaches at Morgan State University um, in Baltimore as a writer and as the best uh, Twitter user that I know. Um, he is a go-to source uh, for clear-eyed critique of speculative futures of any kind. Um, as a designer working with his, uh, uh, sorry, as a designer with his working group for adaptive systems, among other organizations. Uh, Fred's work exhibits a keen sense of playfulness, but also, I think, of genuine uh, care, always keeping an eye on how we might engage the many questions um, posed by emerging technologies, urban planning and development, uh, and ecological crisis. And on that score, um, I, I, I know everybody's aware of the climate strike tomorrow, but I hope there will be some uh, participation um, from this room. Fred's work is reliably inventive, unfailingly thought-provoking, and this book uh, here is no exception. So after a presentation from Fred, I will be joined in conversation uh, by Lydia Calapolidi, um, who recently returned uh, to teach at the Cooper Union School of Architecture and recently published uh, The Architecture of Closed Worlds with Lars Mueller. Um, Lisa Masseri, who is a, a professor of anthropology um, at Yale University and the author of Placing Outer Space, and earthly ethnography of other worlds. And I actually came to you from the uh, uh, University of Virginia, which uh, as a uh, Virginian, I have to uh, point out, I think that her writing is such an important model um, for what a field like ours has to learn from anthropology and science technology studies. So we're delighted to be having uh, this evening, Lisa. And then finally, Felicity Scott needs some introduction. She is a professor of architecture, director of the PhD, uh, co-director of the uh, CCCP program, and uh, the most recent of her books, which you're, of course, familiar with, is uh, Outlaw Territories, um, Environments of Insecurity, um, Architectures of Counterinsurgency. And she's written about these space limits phenomenon in uh, EFLUX, a review, and elsewhere. So I think we have plenty of uh, expertise um, here to uh, help shepherd this conversation with Fred. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Fred Sharman. Uh, um, thank you, James. That was a, a really wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to bring you around for the rest of the book tour, so um, expect uh, expect to cancel your Paris trip. Um, so to, to reiterate some of what, what James just said, I, I also wanted to give a special thanks to, to James and to Jesse Connick as the book's two co-editors. They were uh, so uh, so wonderful to work with. They, they just got it, I think, from the start, and um, they did such an excellent job just bringing everything to ground too, which I, I know wouldn't have happened without them. And uh, thank you also, I should uh, again reiterate uh, to the two image editors, to uh, Emmeline and Jose, uh, they did such a huge task, and there's so much heavy lifting in, in, uh, in the, uh, the work that they did to put everything together, so thank you. And of course, again, Scott Vanderzee, um, who made this object just so functional and beautiful. I, sh I should also thank the Graham Foundation, whose uh, support uh, really was instrumental in making this whole thing possible. And, and we'll say more in conversation, but uh, I, I also want to acknowledge my three co-panelists. 
You all have books that, uh, that came out before and during the process of making this one, and I'm very lucky to have been in dialogue with those books and, and with you all uh, personally, and I hope that that dialogue can continue. So this book's topic is a series of exercises done in the 1970s, partly under the auspices of NASA, to design very large orbital habitats for up to a million people. And these came in three flavors. The Stanford Taurus, the Bernal Sphere, and the O'Neill Cylinder. In particular, the book focuses on a 1975 design workshop, a so-called summer study, at the NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, that brought architects and urban planners to work alongside the space scientists and engineers, along with two painters, Don Davis and Rick Goodis. They made a series of renderings for the project that have had a lasting influence on a number of fields since then. And my book is, in many ways, a close reading of these paintings, drawing out their connections to the more mainstream history of architecture and urban design, and visual culture as well. In this book talk, what I'll try to do is kind of summarize the threads that run through the chapters and the way in which they build the book's stories and arguments. The summer study was led by a Princeton physicist, Dr. Gerard O'Neill. For O'Neill, his own story about this project, this work began in 1969 when he asked his freshman physics students, quote, is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? So as an aside, I was just at a Space Summit conference last week that was convened to commemorate the 50th anniversary of this question. <coughs> the arguments in this book are partly based on opening up the terms presented by O'Neill here. What is important exactly about the nature of surfaces, planets, places, expansion, technology, and of course that very fraught term civilization. And there's a spatial complexity built into this project right from the beginning. When O'Neill had been assigned to teach this introductory course in physics, the first thing he did was to make a course within the course, a space within the space, where he reckoned that what he thought of as the more gifted students could work on special topics directly with him. And he hoped that by answering questions like the one he posed, this subset of students could address problems that were facing, as he put it, quote, all of humanity. At a time in the late 1960s when engineering and technology were getting a bad rap. And so their answer to this question was probably predictably no. The services of planets were not the best places for expanding technological civilizations. Instead of bringing the notions of expansion or technology into play, though, their next step was to design new surfaces in space, away from planets, in orbit, totally defined by technology, wrapped up and closed around themselves, and these surfaces would form the basis for new landscapes, cities, and buildings inside. And this idea of a sequestered group of technicians producing a, a closed world or a walled garden has particular res resonance in design culture. As again, the nature of spaces, virtual and actual, that are designed aligns with the nature of the spaces that those spaces are designed in. So here's Apple's new headquarters. This is recently completed by Foster. Um, and it's also, of course, in Silicon Valley. But besides the formal resonance here, it's important to remember that both of these habitats are places that are designed to include all of the necessities and amenities that an inhabitant might need. And here's the new Google headquarters under construction now, coincidentally right across the street from the NASA Ames Research Center, where the 1975 summer study took place. And this rendering reenacts almost point for point with the running paths, cafes, and terraces Rick Goodis is painting in the Stanford Forest interior. So what is the nature of this wraparound surface? And what are the qualities of the spaces that those surfaces create? When the human inhabitation of outer space was made to seem, for the first time, technically possible, thanks to Konstantin Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation in the late 19th century, scientists supposed that free fall in orbital space would allow new ways of living to be experimented with. In this drawing of Tsiolkovsky's, you can see tiny figures floating, each one with a different body orientation, a different up and down. By the time the International Space Station was designed, space scientists had begun to realize that different orientations in free fall produced confusion, especially among a crew that had so many different cultural and geographic origins. In order to produce more spatial unity, life within the station follows an agreed-on shared set of coordinates that the crew nominally stays oriented to. And the station itself continually adjusts its own orientation to the Earth's surface with gyroscopes. Their down is always the same as our down here on Earth, even though the station orbits 200 miles above us, almost, almost as if it were just a very tall building. But humans can't live in zero gravity for long periods of time. 
Besides the radiation that space exposes our body to, human bone strength, eyesight, and muscle mass starts to degrade after just a few weeks in freefall. So the habitats designed for the 1975 summer study would all rotate to provide artificial gravity inside through centrifugal force. This has some interesting spatial consequences. The overall form of the structures would have to have rotational symmetry, so hence the spheres, toruses, and cylinders. But inside, there would be no horizon falling away from the observer. Instead, the distant territory tips up and presents itself to you in plan or aerial view by the time it's directly overhead. On Earth, we perceive the land to be flat on average, with each of us sharing the same surface, even though that's not the whole story. In the summer study habitats, much smaller than planets, though this drawing is not to scale, it might start to seem that each person was inhabiting their own individual patch of orientation and geometry, with their heads pointed at a common center and their feet pointed out at the blank crochet vacuum void of space. Some researchers in the NASA team thought that these conditions might contribute to something they called solipsism syndrome, a retreat into the self as a person could not avoid dealing with the fact that their entire world was a constructed artifact. In other contemporary media though, entertainment, film, video games, and experiments in cartography like this one from the British studio Bear, designers have speculated that this kind of perception, instead of causing stress, might feel like a kind of superpower the ability to see the near and the far at the same time. And there's precedence for the spatial superpower in the history of architecture, especially in didactic structures like cycloramas and panoramas that make complex environments comprehensible, and in some of the large spaces in visionary neoclassicism that surround the inhabitant of a space with collected knowledge, light, or in the case of Boulay's tomb for Newton, a model cosmos itself. The new surfaces in the 1975 summer study project are also related to another long lineage in architecture and urban design, the desire to get away from the old default ground plane and build new ground in the sky. Whether it's the private ground enabled by the skyscrapers that Rem Koolhaas wrote about in Delirious New York, or as the public ground of roof gardens, podiums, skywalks, and flyovers of Corbusian urbanism in the Radiant City, these projects share the same critique of original urban ground, that it was crowded, dirty, and there was too little left of it to go around. So in the literature and art made for the summer study project, we can see that all the same things that critics were saying about 20th century cities in the 1960s and 1970s are now expanded in scope and used to critique the planet Earth. In North American popular culture from this era, there was, in science fiction and in other media, a growing sense that Earth was too small, that there was not enough room for people to live, not enough resources, and not enough space to throw away pollution and garbage. In 1972, the private think tank, the Club of Rome, published Limits to Growth, a popular science book that said as much, which was widely read and discussed. And in 1973, the popular science fiction film based on a novel titled Make Room, Make Room, speculated that Earth would soon get so overcrowded that everyone would need to eat soil and green, which is made of people. <laughs> if Le Corbusier's solution to congestion is to create a new urban condition in which the whole city is a park, quote, then Gerard O'Neill's team would design a case where the whole new world could be a park and thereby alleviate Earth's overcrowding. But as the designers of parks well know, artificial ground needs maintenance. Famously, the old new ground of the High Line, originally intended by the park's designers to be treated as a found condition, had to be almost completely scraped away and replaced before the new park could be built, as deferred maintenance and neglect had left the hundred-year-old rail bed to rot and rust. And new ground also depends on extraction. Central Park used guano from South America and night soil from New Jersey in order to make the land fertile enough to support new meadows and trees. In O'Neill's project, first the moon and eventually the entire asteroid belt would be strip mined to build more and more new ground in the sky. As artist and theorist Lisa Lepard says, and I'm paraphrasing here, the existence of a new hill or structure in one place implies the existence of a new hole or void someplace else. There's a scene in the philosophy documentary Examined Life, with philosopher Judith Butler taking a walk in San Francisco with disability theorist and artist Sonora Taylor. Butler's on foot, and Taylor is using a motorized wheelchair. They are having a conversation about how the design of certain kinds of spaces and surfaces 
invites some people to use them, and the design of other spaces and surfaces can exclude them. This inclusion and exclusion could be a result of the way a space is formed, and it can be the result of the way the space is operated and controlled. Architects know this lesson, or at least they should, but in the history of human spaceflight, there's a particular story that illustrates this principle. The third crew of the American space station, Skylab, designated Skylab 4, found that the minute-by-minute -minute checklist of tasks from ground control was too much for them to handle. The close coordination between the station and the ground left little flexibility, especially since the large size and complexity of the space was not taken into account by the mission planners. The crew pushed back and took some unscheduled time off to regain their bearings and to look out the window near the galley kitchen that designer Raymond Lowy had specified for them. Order was restored and the schedule adjusted, but for whatever reason, no one in the crew ever got the chance to fly into space again. <laughs> their whole existence as astronauts, able to access space, had been redesigned and redefined. And in NASA's official report from the 1975 summer study, a similar story lies buried. The section on urban planning in the habitats specifies the amount of square footage that should be given over to different functions inside. The urban planners collected data on things like public space from world cities. They looked at the average of the low end, and then they decided to cut this number almost in half. The habitats would have agricultural areas, they reasoned, so that space would also be available to residents. Meanwhile, in another room, presumably, at the summer study, the agriculturalists are expecting that the farms they're designing could produce twice the world's record yield for crops like tomatoes all year around, but only if the spaces could get 24-hour sunlight, constant high humidity and heat, and a specialized atmosphere supercharged with carbon dioxide, which sounds increasingly like our atmosphere. <laughs> And indeed, the design of spaces and operations within these habitats would have had to accommodate many kinds of non-humans as well, including chickens, rabbits, and fish. The non-human animals in the Stanford Taurus, according to the 1975 design, would outnumber humans 35 to 1. And this has always been the case. Um, animals were the first Earthlings to go into space. This crew uh, launched just a few months before Yuri Gagarin's historic flight. Design here is just as much about systems as it is about objects. And as the Stanford Taurus details were specified, the engineers used network and directed graph diagrams to keep track of the flows of matter and energy within the habitat. And this impulse was kind of a symptom of an overall obsession with systems during this period. The basis for the Club of Rome's work in Limits to Growth had been to diagram the human relationship with the planet Earth using these same methods. And Gerard O'Neill offered a direct rebuke to the Club of Rome when he testified before Congress in 1975 that any, as he put it, limits to growth would be un-American and that his project of space settlements would, in contrast, offer plenty of, as he said, room to grow. Up to 3,000 times the surface of the Earth if you disassemble the entire asteroid belt, according to his projections. He also offered to Congress an indirect rebuke to the work of biologist Rachel Carson and her millions of readers when he suggested that the space settlements could be refuges for birds endangered by the pesticide poisoning that she wrote about in Silent Spring. O'Neill noted in his own book that no pesticides would be necessary in these habitats because they would be careful to avoid importing pests in the first place. And these fears and hopes about the future are related to the same impulses that drive science fiction as a cultural mode. O'Neill himself was always very quick to dismiss any direct connection between his work and science fiction. He always insisted on the plausibility of his proposals that were, as he said, quote, possible within the bounds of current technology, which would be the technology of the mid-1970s. But the two painters on the project were both avid readers and watchers of science fiction. They sometimes even illustrated the covers of science fiction books. So this influence is evident in the architecture and space making shown in their renderings for O'Neill. And the complicated relationships between science fiction, classic utopianism, architecture, space science, apocalypse, and popular culture are the subject of chapter five in this book. These connections, especially in the 1970s, as evident in that era's visual culture, are deep and rich. The summer study work represents an important nodal point where these things come together. And chapter six in the current book pushes these connections further. It looks at two interrelated critical concepts that both deal with issues of very large scale. One from science fiction studies, the big dumb object, is a way to describe the overwhelming sublime effects of structures whose origin and purpose seem unclear, but that also seem to be the key to whole new worlds. 
And at the same time, the architectural category of the megastructure openly invites participation, engagement, and interaction, all this time in the user's terms. Both are transformative, but in complementary ways. And in large-scale structures like the space settlements, both design approaches are necessary for mitigating what theorist Frederick Jameson calls the dialectic of identity and difference. It's ultimately these paintings themselves that act in culture. If not to resolve all of these contradictions, then at least to somewhat uneasily settle some of the arguments and conflicts between different disciplines and communities that have been involved in the project. The paintings are often deliberate provocations made by the artists to intentionally raise more questions than they answer about the possibilities for life inside these spaces. Public constituencies are built around these paintings, encompassing everyone who reacts to that provocation, whether pro or con. These paintings have been in the public domain since they were made, but this book is the first time that they're all collected together in print. So we're also so glad to be able to publish in the book's appendix, and again, thanks to the Graham Foundation for this, um, many of the sketches that the artists made for the project and other related work. And I think that these, again, foreground the fact that these artifacts were made for very specific purposes by specific people with unique backgrounds, themselves in very specific, sometimes closed, sometimes open and interconnected, spaces, disciplinary and otherwise. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by making an assumption about whether this book documents a history of the present, a history of the past, a history of uh, a future that never happened, or a history of uh, our current developments. And, and I think that um, in the way that I write it, and in the way that I see the world around us, it is not I cannot think of space settlements as a future that never happened. Even though it does demarcate a vivid moment in cultural imagination um, to conquer an inhabitable lands and this kind of vast desire of, and the fiction of um, the vast blank space that we have to conquer and the idea that this space might be free and we might reinvent humanity from scratch within that space, um, I think you, you're telling us a different story. Um, I think that uh, the book is narrating a story not of, of a history of obsolescence, of beautiful objects and machines that are no longer uh, working, uh, but really pointing us to a much stranger present and reality. So if we look beyond, let's say, Inception and Elysium and the, and the filmmaking of Christopher and Lola, I think that reality is much stranger and multiverse than fiction. Um, and you rightfully uh, point to us uh, Google's headquarters by uh, Derek Engels and Thomas Heatherwick, the project of hegemony and control of weather, leisure, uh, work, and life. Um, what is Apple's headquarters by Foster and Partners, a perfectly rounded space, both literally and conceptually? And also, I will add Amazon's spherical jungle jungles by NBBJ. Um, if not all space colonies. Um, so these, I think the spaceship lives amongst us and it is, it is part of our life. It's, it's not about making space, it's, it's, it's in the earth, but it really recreates this kind of um, desire to uh, create a power structure for control. Um, and uh, these giant corporate bubbles of massive venture capital investment are no longer representations of weather control and pollution, as was Bucky's dome over Manhattan in 1960. Um, they are many of those power structures controlling bodies and psyches within a perfectly controlled atmospheric medium uh, to keep constancy and um, augment productivity. And um, if you, I have checked in particular uh, certain uh, comments of Amazon and the money that they spend to curate biodiversity within the headquarters of offices, which was extraordinary to me that they hired this guy for five years um, and they, the, the whole enterprise to carry the whole uh, biodiversity and specimens of plants uh, took them four years uh, to curate these plants in order to uh, increased productivity of workers because of the biofilm hypothesis. Um, so this environment uh, was, was, was really uh, to kind of 
foster capital um, and to, to curate a certain <coughs> kind of uh, circadian rhythm of work, uh, basically, in labor. Um, and, and I think that um, this story begins from, from this desire of humanity to recreate the cell phone scratch. Um, I'm also thinking that these kind of space settlements have a different life today. Um, I don't know if you have seen Saturday Night Live, The Bubble 2017. Um, but, um, if you haven't, it, I was going to show it, but it's just like, it's two minutes I, out of my five. Um, uh, so I can't show it, but watch it in YouTube. It's extraordinary. Um, and uh, it really shows a dome, not over Manhattan. It, it's almost like Rocky's dome was transposed over Brooklyn. But instead of, of, of it becoming an artifact to protect us from weather and pollution and, and create a kind of um, energy-bound um, topology, it was, it was to house liberals when Trump got elected from hearing the other people outside <laughs> from that bubble. And um, it was extraordinary to see that this kind of architectural artifact that became iconic of, 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 of our history of architecture since the 1960s had become literally a space where we use social media um, in a way to create echo chambers and not listen to the voice of others. So what this video vividly shows us is that if, um, if there was a kind of idealization of the idea of networking in the 1990s, and um, the kind of distribution of information, the knowledge being dependent on that kind of distribution, um, it, it, it really, uh, the, the situation got inversed, almost like your surfaces get inversed and wrapped inside, uh, from inside out, and are creating these, these bubbles of, of coexistence. And I, I found that in your description of the solipsism syndrome, which I did not know, um, and uh, the idea that because of this um, enclosure and the echo chamber and the voice that we keep reiterating, we always hear the voice of ourselves um, through the, our choices, through the reiteration of our choices, um, we are becoming a self-referential reality. Um, and um, it was extraordinary to see that that was a syndrome related to uh, space occupancy. So um, thank you for that. So um, the space settlement is, is, is a topological bubble as a planet inside out, in the words of Gerard O'Neill, um, and has been consistently planned as a gigantic living machine of ingestion and excretion, carefully calibrated so as human material and now data capital never crosses the boundaries of its circle. O'Neill's question, which you raised, which is extraordinarily simple but so important, whether the planetary surface is the right surface for us to occupy, is both in many ways a mathematical but also a hygienic question. Mathematical in the sense that there is a space that, that's being turned inside out and reversing the topology. So instead of, of uh, you know, architects thinking of Cartesian coordinates uh, they could think of stereographic navigational system and spherical system of, sort of representation, replacing the three-dimensional axis to a panoramic viewpoint dependent on you, me, the user, um, uh, referencing the self, which is a very different way of thinking of space. Um, but it's also a hygienic argument in the fact that the bubble in the spaceship cannot be detached, as you very well show us in the book, from the framework of social and political unrest throughout the 60s and 70s that rendered cities as dark places of smog, lacking oxygen. Um, they not only, these kinds of bubbles, not only control the weather for the purposes of comfort and leisure, but also operated as types of prophylactic from the dirty urbanity. And in the words of uh, somebody that drew an experimental city and talked about the fuller, Athelstan Spielhaus, um, who drew an experimental city, um, it was to protect from the filth, ugliness, congestion, and noise of, of urban life. So another level, the bubble enforces by standards of comfort and well-being for the entirety of the human race, um, like a power structure that maintains and manages constancy over bodies and psyches. Uh, the space settlement provides a homogenized atmosphere in order to control and predict 
the behavior of growth of bodies as tools within a constant atmospheric uh, medium controlled by whom, as you rightfully ask in the book. Uh, how long have I been speaking? Can I, uh, mm -hmm. should I? <coughs> <coughs> I? I will pass, and I have another thing to say, but I think I'll say it in, so that I don't become exhausted. I will pass on and I'll say it. All right, well, again, congratulations, Fred. Um, just such a fun text to read with, um, to think with, and to read in this past day or two. Um, so space elements can be read and enjoyed as a tribute to interdisciplinarity. The primary protagonists, O'Neill, who we heard about, but also Buckminster Fuller and Stuart Brand, were polymaths, uh, each with their own disciplinary affinity whose work seeped beyond their control to bring forth these sprawling transdisciplinary enterprises. But Fred's book is itself a testament to the power of interdisciplinary thought, weaving together not only architectural theory, but also literary criticism, gender theory, environmental sciences, cybernetics, media studies, and a host of others, including science and technology studies, which is the interdiscipline that I'm ostensibly here to represent. Um, so it's a lovely move then that Fred ends the book by drawing out the word settlement as a fitting descriptor of such interdisciplinary work not only in its preferable connotations to colony, though settlement is by no means pristine, but also in the dynamism inherent in the term. So quoting Fred um, on the last page to prove I made it to the end. <laughs> if colonizing implies a power that has come to stay, control, and exploit, then maybe the uncertain temporary transactional nature of settlement is more appropriate. This is how transdisciplinary exchange takes place. So one discipline does not, does not colonize another, but rather interweaving disciplines are settled, again quoting Fred, provisionally occupied for a time, with an awareness that there's always a possibility of hopping into a spaceship and going off somewhere else. So and indeed, uh, Fred's meditation on O'Neill's space settlements involves boarding many a spaceship to explore the tentacular sprawl of a seemingly niche and contained project. This project began with that straightforward question. In 1969, O'Neill asked his students, is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? Answering in the negative, a decade of work produced alternative floating surfaces and accompanying imaginations. If Giuliano Bruno has described surfaces as architectures of relations, then the surfaces of outer space that Fred writes about are relations of architecture. But even more than this, they are meditations on the substance and meaning of worlds. So as a provocation and starting off point for discussion drawn from my own discipline, I'd like to riff on Donna Haraway, who is herself riffing on Marilyn Strathern, and wonder, um, with the relations Fred has provided, what worlds, world, worlds? So let me say that again. What worlds, world, worlds? The plurality of worlds is key. As Fred attends to the ways in which the space settlements and the scientific and architectural projects that Fred draws connections between are multiply understood. I've actually always been quite taken by the work of the two artists who served as the primary world builders for O'Neill, Davis and Goodis, and so was fascinated to read Fred's interpretation of the different kinds of worlds their paintings produced. If Goodis worlded worlds that centered on an ideal human melting pot of human beings, Fred suggests that Davis showed us worlds not necessarily for humans, but worlds that humans could nonetheless be with. Fred offers so many beautiful meditations on the world being produced, uh, but I'd love to hear more about the worlds that enacted these worldings. Not just the broader cultural context, which Fred carefully draws out, but in fact the more contained worlds uh, that these world builders imagined themselves to inhabit. So this returns us to the tension of colony versus settlement. In the end, the world that worlded these worlds was in fact that of mid-century white American heteronormative men. And to be clear, this is not a critique of Fred. He knows about this about his story, and in his scholarship provides an exquisite model of blunting the white maleness of this historical moment with voices of women and other marginalized people, both historically and contemporary. Oh, uh, and oh, how I want to live in the world that Fred worlds. Um, but he is well aware that O'Neill's space settlements, rebranded today as space <coughs> colonies, have been given a 21st century facelift by Jeff Bezos, who, unlike Fred, 
sees the world made primar sees the world as made primarily for him and those like him. Mm. While Fred explores the irony of pastoral, sublime, and utopic imaginations of space settlements, Bezos unironically sees a world that he has been promised to him, that has been promised to him, and that he have now has the capital to bring forth. So I'm so glad that this book is hopeful and searching for futures that we can all see ourselves in. But in, in this conversation, if not on the printed page, I'd love to hear a bit more about the world from which these worlds come and how that might help us better understand and interdisciplinarily engage with the most powerful actors who are today imagining space futures. Thank you. My comments are coming. Follow on very much more than I'm trying to get my notes here, but um, also to begin by congratulating you and also um, to set up and uh, people involved in the world. <coughs> really uh, amazing project of Richard and an account of the uh, visual and architectural dimensions of um, um, uh, sort of affiliated with O'Neill's truly sort of fantastic vision. And, and I also appreciated as you went through in your presentation the multiple ways that you connected it to, um, uh, to familiar architectural landmarks, the uh, mm -hmm. as we saw, or, uh, and a number of them, Fuller, uh, Smithsons, Boulay, etc. And I think that um, uh, there's some really important work there. And, um, and I also wanted to just underscore how much I appreciate the um, publishing of the archival documents from the yeah. Yeah, NASA Ames Research Center. I think this is also a major contribution of the book. So I think this is all uh, really great. And, and I, I just actually want to uh, begin also by making some connections to the present um, that I've been thinking about around space colonization and, uh, and go from there to ask a couple of questions. And, um, and so I'm going to flash back briefly. Um, so in 1976, after closing, as you know, the heroic, heroic Apollo program in 1972 uh, and the manned expeditions to Skylab in 1974, NASA redirected the agency's attention from outer space exploration to focus on Earth science um, research and environmental monitoring. Um, um, yeah. One of the many responses to perceived threats to your security, one of resource scarcity, pollution, and population growth uh, in the so-called developing world. And so seeking to reverse that reversal and proposing to boost the role of private companies like SpaceX, and like Blue Origin, uh, in NASA's future set space missions. Um, in April 2016, Representative Jim Bridenstine Republican from Oklahoma sponsored the American Space Renaissance Act, the ASRA, announcing, and I quote, that the purpose of this bill is to permanently secure the United States of America as the preeminent space faring nation. Uh, and this bill breaks down um, uh, in an really interesting way to national security issues, civil and commercial goals, and each call for architecture, uh, infrastructure, and sort of geography based research. And so Britain had been the preeminent seafaring empire at the height of colonial rule of Earth, something much celebrated, of course, by Fuller. Uh, the US yeah, now seeks to update this paradigm uh, of what we might think of the new colonial world order, or we'll come back uh, to speak to that. And then in September 2017, uh, with absolutely no scientific or technical training, uh, Weinstein was nominated by Trump uh, to head NASA. His appointment confirms him after the yeah, Senate in, in 2018. Uh, and alluding then to the shock of the Soviet Union's 1957 launch of Sputnik, uh, he declared that this was our Sputnik moment. And uh, we'll come back to that. And so, in a flashback to Gerard K. Neal, uh, Brenton also announced that Earth's moon should be mined for fuel and that it should serve as a proving ground for travel to Mars, the latter, of course, a uh, key aspect of Trump's Make America Great Again space agenda, uh, hence all the news about the Mars. Uh, but if O'Neill claimed, uh, somewhat cynically, I think, that strip mining the moon would be in the interest of saving Earth's environment, uh, Bridenstine makes no such claim, his interests being aligned uh, quite directly with one of Trump's earliest post-election victory announcements, the plan to cut NASA's budget for Earth science research, uh, with climate change studies um, uh, now being projected as politicized science, uh, and to redirect the agency's attention back to outer space, is what's flipping that I'm interested in. And so in retrospect, I want to suggest then that the military, psychological, and economic agendas uh, at work in this new renaissance seem to appeal not just to NASA's heroic period, uh, post Sputnik, of course, uh, although I think the imagery of the space race not only really plays out in um, uh, renderings that we've seen, but 
uh, but here as well. But it also, I think, alludes to this complex of sort of nexus of nationalism and privatization uh, that O'Neill quite explicitly fostered, and of the seductive but misleading fiction of providing technical scientific aid uh, for a global humanity. Uh, this was how we garnered both the yeah, national and international support for so to do so. And so it's not surprising that O'Neill's vision of space colonization was uh, repeatedly likened to the European discovery of the new world and to the ideology of manifest destiny associated with the 19th century American frontier. Yeah, at a moment, yeah, back then in the 70s, uh, a moment when US expansion and economic growth seemed threatened by resource scarcity, environmental degradation, nuclear fallout, um, political pressures both at home and in developing countries, uh, notably including the uh, oil rich OPEC nations. Yes. Uh, space colonization promised continuity in US economic supremacy and pioneering know-how. And so it's this constellation, I think, that's returning with some force. Uh, and it's reported recently in Scientific American, uh, with some alarm a couple of years ago, and I quote here, echoing Trump's America First theme, Vice President Mike Pence said Trump intended to carry nationalism into space, with a new emphasis on human space exploration and discovery for the benefit of American people and all of the world. And so again, tying this nationalist claim uh, to a humanitarian goal. So again, reversing the NASA's decades-long participation in international partnerships the Trump administration now famously called for American boots on the face of Mars. Uh, and so maybe I'll go past this, but I, you know, I wanted to, you know, I don't this, but um, uh, we also know what we said they, yeah, Trump um, uh, declared his intention to direct uh, the Pentagon to establish a sixth branch of uh, the US military, um, yeah, called Space Force, uh, announcing also that it would be great for the psyche of the country. Yeah, and so playing directly back into this cultural imaginary, um, uh, but also using language like dominance in space. Uh, uh, so it was pointed out, of course, that space would quite explicitly be a war, and I'm quoting here, a war fighting domain, uh, like the land, uh, sea, and air, yeah, quite literally a reconception of space that was itself likely to spur an arms race uh, in space and make war fighting more likely. And I'm citing a, a time journalist there. And so when you end your book, um, and, uh, very last words here, I did read your book, by asking uh, who can blame them being the, uh, the renderers, yeah, the, the artists, who can blame them for the compelling nature of the pictures uh, I, I think this is an excellent question to be asking, um, but I would want to push it a bit further on this. And um, uh, yeah, so we certainly need to read Davis and Gudit. I don't know if it's Gudit. It's not a kind. He's as good as yeah. Okay, uh, in a historical moment, yeah? understanding the complex field of techno optimism, of libertarianism, of nationalism that was at play in the 1970s, and we need to take into account that they were. Um, basically doing work for higher jobs, as I was affiliated with NASA, um, when such optimistic images you know, played so um, strategically and so successfully uh, into a series of desires operating in the service of this expansionist agenda, uh, I do want to wonder um, why we couldn't suggest that artists and with them architects uh, might not be asked to take a little bit more responsibility yeah, for the fiction that they participate in um, yeah, and, and that they launch through these types of images. Uh, for they can also be read, again, in strategic or even quite dangerous fictions, um, not to say that they're somehow constitutively responsible for the neoliberal trajectory that this story would take in the 1980s, yeah, as it connects not only to the L5 society all the way through, through Ronald Reagan and the SDI initiative, and I can go on and on about that. Um, 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 but, but really also thinking about the role the images played in forging a particular type of political disposition. And I'm wondering if we don't need to read that a little bit differently as well. And, and so given my slightly different interests, um, uh, I was also really struck by the positive tone that you set for design opportunities throughout the book. And it seems uh, as if at a number of moments you really beautifully point to important contradictions at play, you know, to all these ethical political quagmires, to the questions of colonialism, of racism, of the sleepy wide epistemologies of, of, and subjects at play here. Uh, and you even open by citing Gil Scott Heron's um, um, uh, Why Is on the Moon there, which is like an opening to the book. Um, uh, so, so I mean, uh, mark out a really concise awareness of all these issues. Um, but your approach 
remains, or this is what I want to ask you, that are drawing out positive lessons for, for architecture and design, um, yeah, tracing these other possible features yeah, that, that might be harbored in this legacy. And, and so I too always you know, would read these types of ambivalences or instabilities as harboring other features, and I'm not in any way uh, in a disagreement with that. Um, but I wanted to, to draw you out a little bit around uh, uh, how you, know, you intended to navigate the sort of progressive and potentially progressive ends that are, let's say, inherent to this type of work. Yeah? So, so again, to have you speak a little bit more about what motivated you to dig this material out of the sand, as Foucault would say, uh, at this particular historical moment. And on a related note, um, um, uh, this is, I'm not going to say nearly as much as you did, but a similar question, you know, right before, right literally also at the end, when you return to this polemic around the term space colonization, you mentioned brands, you know, undocumented, uh, claimed that the US State right. Department had expressly forbidden the use of the term, but that they insisted that it was nevertheless um, uh, an effective term. Um, uh, when you continue to use that, with the exception of those remarks, you don't really draw out the, the uh, equally problematic um, um, uh, figure of settlements, not only settler colonialism, yeah. um, settlements in the context of Israel Palestine and elsewhere. And so, you know, settlements is not necessarily that less, you know, charged the term in terms of expansionist agendas. And so, so I also wanted to hear a little bit more, and then I have one final time remark. I'm sorry, I'm not to be done here. Um, the very first image after your conclusion, um, one of my favorite images, includes two women at the front of the, uh, of the group photograph from the 1975 study. And, uh, but women, the women involved in the study don't really play um, uh, uh, any role in, in the account. I've never come across any references to them. So I wonder who they were, what they did, or if you were able to find any, um, yeah, any evidence beyond this photograph of, um, of their participation. Fred, uh, start preparing your question. <laughs> but I think Fred has some, uh, some uh, yeah, a to chew on. Yeah, quite quite a few things to chew on there. Um, I I think to start with the most recent question, I think that's a, that's a there are a lot of there are a lot of threads to follow Albert from this work, and that's certainly not the least provocative one. Um, another thread that I found late in the game was a, was a kind of hidden figure in uh, the space settlement project who was a black space scientist uh, at a NASA facility who became a kind of evangelist for the project on O'Neill's behalf during the 1980s. So um, we, were, we weren't ever able to find out the identity of those two women. There, there's some speculation, and I've become, during the course of this research, a member of a lot of um, some good, some bad, space enthusiast Facebook groups. <laughs> and uh, so we put them to, to work. You know, we kind of crowdsourced the, the identity of some of those folks. Yeah. And I think at one point they had, they had narrowed in on one of the two women, but the other remains unknown, uh, yeah. uh, which is which is a really uh, a really telling, I think, lacuna in the, in the archive, because they certainly don't show up. There's, there's one woman who shows up in the, in the credits of the Official NASA report, which is also titled Space Settlements. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other one remains in there. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, to, to, to talk to some of um, Lydia's questions and Lisa's questions and, and your narrative about the history of, of NASA Felicity uh, during the 80s since, uh, since the Space Settlement Project and then up to the present day is, is really. It's, it's, it's really worth sitting with because it's kind of like, it almost critiques itself, is the amazing thing. When, when, when Bezos creates, when Jeff Bezos creates a habitat like the spheres and presents it in PR terms as this idealized ecology, um, and then right away turns around and does this incredibly pastiche, high frontier, redux proposal this, in the, this July. You know, he made his own renderings. This, Part of his, uh, his own private space like company, Blue Origin, uh, that, that are just so awful. It, it, it's almost not even worth like writing about or calling out. 
and that the present state of, of the conversation in the current political administration about why people should go to space is just it's, it's just so obvious and stupid that it's and, but but it needs to be it needs to be addressed and it should be addressed and I I I would almost turn the question around to um, to our disciplines it's architecture and architecture history theory and criticism. And to, and to STS, because I think that, that one thing that they share, one of the many things that those, that those approaches share in common is, is we sort of follow the, the practitioners, say, if, if you like, the, the nominal producers of knowledge, follow them around and point out, like, hey, you're not really thinking about this context, or this, there's this other cultural history there, but they don't care. <laughs> like, they don't, there's almost like, I, I don't want to take a cynical view, because I am, at heart, very optimistic, as, as, as you will point out, as, a, as I think a lot of the book like kind of presents about ways to be in space and on Earth. Mm -hmm. But when when critique seems so out of steam, you know, um, what what do we do <laughs> in that case when presented with these areas that seem so there's just so many seams and fault lines? That where do you where do you start? I, I went to the belly of the beast earlier in the summer. I went out to the Bay Area to break through dialogues, which is one of Stuart Brand's uh, children uh, in the world. And I was asked to speak about the, you know, uh, on a panel with a bunch of astrophysicists and stuff about space from an anthropological perspective. And I had one message. I just wanted to be like, maybe we shouldn't use the word colonization. That was like all I said. I had five minutes, and I was just like, here's why it's problematic. It has a That was it. I was really not challenged. I wasn't saying we should go to space. I wasn't like entering, because I'm still having a limits to growth argument over there. I wasn't even entering there. I was I, I was vehemently attacked by people saying that I was denying them their right of individual freedom, like a very neoliberal argument. And that confronted me this question of I did get Stuart Brand on my side. He happened to be in the room for that conversation, and he was beginning to show some of his experience. Um, but I, I just like I was so not excited to further pursue the conversation because there was no desire on this kind of silo, Tom Valley, techno optimism um, ears to be open to critique, and I, it was just like so easily misinterpreted. And I, of course, I would take some blame for maybe still not being as clear as I needed to be. But it, I think that's totally the problem: is they don't want the critique, and we can't force force it on to these powerful, powerful people. Um, which is why I kind of just want to go live in your happy world and like, <laughs> I'll take a toroid and just kind of go on. So similarly, I was at the at the Space Settlements Conference I was at last just last week in Seattle. Um, I I was asked to present on the history of Gerard O'Neill's ideas, and I I'm not an engineer like many of the people in the audience were, and many of the people in the panels were. So I I presented his work in cultural and art, in you know, artistic history uh, context. And everybody was like, okay, that's, like, all right, that's, that's great. Let's talk about mining the asteroids. And, um, and even in the asteroid mining presentation, um, there, was, there was a brief slide that was like, mine the asteroids, da 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 da, end scarcity. And, and then nobody really followed up on that. They just talked about how they had gotten the Obama administration to change the law to allow for asteroid mining to take place and how great that was. One of the questioners applauded the asteroid miners because they said the last thing we want is the people at The Hague telling our asteroid miners what to do, which is a really telling moment. So, and when asked about, you know, okay, let's go back to end scarcity. How's that going to happen? And the, the only answer was, well, we'll be able to make more iPhones because we can get rare earth off the planet, and we'll be able to deliver electricity for pennies per megawatt. So it's just trickle-down economics, and it's these bizarre performance indicators for human prosperity that I don't even know where to start with. <laughs> 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 that, um, I think there's an inherent problem of representation, of accepted modes of representation, um, when these kinds of meetings occur, kind of kind of like the Macy's conference where you have biologists and mathematicians and, and different kind of disciplines, speaking of interdisciplinarity, and each, let's say, discipline or trajectory feels comfortable looking at certain representational modalities 
and the engineers see this process through flowcharts entirely. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned them diagrams or, or systems. And the direct diagrams. <coughs> but uh, you, do, you do speak of O'Neill's hesitation to use images because he found them, he, he didn't think it was a plausible medium, it was maybe going beyond, beyond the expectation of what was possible. In, in terms of scientific, and he felt more comfortable with, with equations. So I think there's, there's, there's a real problem of these kinds of representations when we're speaking about such a complex problem of recreating, basically, you mentioned it, a biological and artificial system. It's not just architecture that we have. We have a certain you know, agenda language of representation. Uh, there are that there are you know, artificial synthetic lives and, and their, their engineering uh, circles and their mathematical equations and, and, it, and there's such, there's such <coughs> overlap between, between these systems that um, I think that's what caused, let's say, the terrible presentations of Bezos, which were 1970s. I mean, it was almost intentional. When I saw them, I started laughing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was terrible. It was terrible to an extent that it should have been intentional. It can't be that bad for somebody that has so much money. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know who those artists were because they, they're playing a joke on it. It has to be a purpose yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 It can't be. But they had all these images. Probably there was some like intentional, you know, going back to these kinds of representations that you bring up from Davis and Jim Beachin. I don't know. Goodis. Yeah. Goodis. Goodis. Yeah. Goodis. Okay. Uh, whatever the pronunciation is. I, I think there was some intentionality in how that representation is going to work and, and you know, kind of marketing for who it is going to appeal in terms of a number of consumers or viewers who are going to, to, to visit that. Because in, in our discipline, we still haven't found a way to, um, to, to represent environmental systems uh, in a non-detective way that has the intelligence of a drawing. And, and I think that's a very, very big problem because in these kinds of books, and, and I think in, in, in my book as well, you only have the engineering flowchart, which is the representation of a, di of a diagram, of an algorithm, basically, which is a process which can be mapped in very simple steps. And you have a pictorial representation, and there's a humongous gap between how we can negotiate intelligence of different flows of an environment to be represented and to create a kind of convincing medium. And, and I think that's what, I think that's a very big problem, not, not the use for space settlements, and I totally agree with you <coughs> being a terrible word and so forth, I don't need to derail the conversation. But I think it's an accurate word in what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's an inaccurate word. I mean, that's my point, in a way. So, yeah. It is, it is very accurate, but if we want to reflect that on, on, on what we're doing as architects and how we represent this kind of phenomena, I think there's a tremendous lack of deduction uh, in the way that we use language as a presentation. I think that's really well put. And I think that, that, starts, to, that starts to help me articulate another answer to um, this is your question about the relationship of the artist to the project. Is it this sort of Trojan horse that sort of sneaks in the idea through the cultural and popular imagination? I, I think, I want to believe that there's, and we um, were just speaking about Keller recently, I was a student of hers as well, I know your colleagues and friends. Um, I, I've been fascinated by, by much of her work, but especially this, this idea that, um, that critique can, uh, can proceed by way of a kind of hyper compliance, mm -hmm. uh, a way of delivering exactly to spec and then some, which, which I think um, Rick Goodis is doing. And it, it came out a little bit during our interviews. He sort of says, he, Rick Goodis was trained as an architect, and he worked as, a, as a, what they call a graphic artist, so graphic designer or, or marketing artist during the uh, 70s as well. So he, he knows how to sell things, and he, he says this in, in one of the interviews that I conducted with him. And so he's, he's consciously trying to sort of hyper-comply with the brief, yeah. and the brief is to create a French countryside in space. So he goes, okay, that's what, you know, that's what you're going to get. But he said, I know, you know, as, as an architect, I know cost per square foot, but this is not going to be so plausible. <laughs> so he's using that, that kind of strategy, I hope, I want to believe he is. Um, and they're seeing this through a contemporary lens themselves, so their memories are, you know, filtered and being recomposed as they're, as they're remembering their roles in the project. And then Don Davis was, uh, his background was originally to illustrate planetary science for, um, among other things, Carl Sagan's journal, Icarus. 
in the late 1960s, early 1970s. He was the first artist that got to work for the USGS in the Planetary Science mm -hmm. Illustration Division. So he's really thinking about, okay, this is this is a world. And you know, as, as you're saying, no one's really figured out how to draw a world. And he's trying to draw a world in a way that critiques the idea that someone can make a world. So I think his project is a little bit aligned with Rachel Carson's work. Um, they're talking about what falls through that directed network graph map. But a world, you know, almost in a ontological sense, is always more than you can represent. And so, how dare you not only try to represent, but also remake every aspect of the world. I think that's Rachel Carson's critique, or one of her many uh, critiques, and it's also Don Davis's critique. And I think, you know, to, to, to use your terms, Lisa, he's, he's enacting a kind of planetary imagination when he's, when he's making these paintings. I think that's really important. So I, I do think there's some pushback or friction, you know, however, however they can manage to do so as sort of hired guns to paint these habitats. Yeah. We have a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I read the book, um, Fred and I are clear friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's your username? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I'm a space architect, so I actually graduated with GSAP, and I work as a space architect here in New York. Um, and I don't know another space architect in New York, so um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, but there's, there's, I think, this confrontation between the, the sort of Jeff Bezos imaginary, um, or whatever you want to call it, and the actual work is something that I like, confront with every single day because I have a very strong sort of ethical objection to the sort of you know, slashing health benefits for Amazon workers so we can pay for Blue Origin, um, that kind of thing. But guess what email I got today? I got an email from a space architecture sort of group, uh, listserv, that from, from a guy who left NASA to work for Blue Origin and is, is a space architect with a degree from Yale and an aerospace degree from Maryland, and he posted a position for senior space architect at Blue Origin just like three days ago. And so what did I do? I went to the listing page and I went through all what I needed to do to apply. Um, and that's really just like me sort of being vulnerable and saying that there's this there's this tension of like I wanna make I wanna have that dream job, I wanna make that I wanna be part of the aesthetic sort of um, formation of this new world, right? Um, and I love I love your cover. Um, so to me that if you're if you're asking the question, we don't know, you know, how do we draw the world? I think that your cover is against how do we draw the blackness of space? And there's this there's this point in the book where where someone makes a comment on like the rendering being like, what is the space is black? Like this is not purple and pink and you know orange. Um, and that to me is like the perfect cover of your book because it's really about just pulling out something from nothing. Um, as, as a technically minded person, whenever I see, and I, and I had this, you know, my, my, my sort of heart sank when I saw the, the Jeff Bezos uh, redux, is that in terms of life support systems and these just impossibly unimaginably complex artificial ecosystems, there is no science or mathematics for that to be possible. It doesn't exist. It's 100% fiction today, and I, I think the only way we could possibly crack that, and, and, and I know this is something Fred has tweeted once, but I just remember this tweet, uh, <laughs> was that the only way we're going to crack that is possibly with artificial intelligence, um, is to put machines to work on the impossible complexity of, of these systems, um, and just take cybernetics to a whole new level. Um, if we if we be able to crack that, then I think, you know, the the sort of mathematics and science, kind of the dominoes fall over, we can do it. But um, something, you, you, despite how crazy that is, um, there's something very quaint about the, the images, there's something very quaint about these physical simulations, um, where today we live in like basically a simulation. Um, I think it's funny that Elon Musk is one of these people who talks about who likes to popularize this question of do we live in a simulation? Um, and I, I think we kind of already do, except we don't live in a physical world outside of the planet. We live in built bubbles, we get guided around by algorithms, and we are basically, um, 
you, you can't tell something is real or being fake. So um, I'm like, I, I love I love what this book, I love the book, and I love this discussion. It's really, really been awesome. And I would love that GSAP could bring back a formal study of space architecture, which existed when I was a student, and then got canceled. So I was going to love the last the last group to do that. Um, it's it's just too rich to not have it in school, and whether you can take so many different angles, so I definitely advocate for that. We will definitely consider adding that. <laughs> yeah, we actually, I, I, I think that the, it would be great to be able to have some good conversation over uh, drinks. But I was thinking, are, are there a couple last sort of quick hitting questions that anybody wants to put on? I the just wanted to uh, respond. Come back to the the drawing question. I mean, I think. Um, in addition to laughing about the more recent renderings, um, for me, one of the very telling moments um, is I mean, when you showed some of the, the, you know, the fish coming out to eat the, the insect and reminded us that um, um, uh, O'Neill imagined that insects would be necessary. And you know, of course, we all laughed because we all know insects are necessary for our lives, you know, for pollination and all the rest of it. And, you like bats? And and bats are yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> so, but what gets me, I mean, um, Come back to the, the world drawing is is it's not is that moment when we laugh um, and yet these it, it, yet these claims were so powerful and so yeah in retrospect they're entirely ridiculous um, and yet they function you know to convince many members of the U.S. Congress to you know garner millions and millions of dollars and and so it's it's not about the the the, the technical it's something, you know, something different is going on. And so, so this, this, this is where I think it becomes really complicated and, and, and also um, one of many places. I mean, I would answer something like, yes, it'd be great if we could draw worlds differently, but, but I think there's going to be things that um, uh, might be better done in text, let's say, or from critique. Or, I mean, in terms of actually understanding the world from which these worlds come from, uh, I, I, I don't... Um, uh, I mean, I think the, there's like so much still to be done in putting those images and those fictions and O'Neill's um, uh, incredible salesmanship back into the context of the 19, late 60s and throughout the 1970s to understand why it did become so closely aligned with the other economic paradigms and, you know, not just the libertarianism of plan, but uh, so, so, so I would say something like um, that to me is the question, like, even if we can laugh and we can continue to laugh, these things function sensorically, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. logically, yeah, yeah. uh, and so that's what it is. And, um, and that's what I think critique can do as a supplement. To not to say you're going to change the mind of these characters. I was also speaking in the bottom of a nuclear bunker in Sweden a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> and went. also yeah. I was, was a Swedish um, space engineer, and, and you know, I finished talking and she said, well, that was a lot of words, but um, really, science is neutral. And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> as though she operated in the, the designing, you know, yeah. technologies for, yeah, yeah, and, and so, I mean, and I appreciate internationalism in certain periods of space work, and I think that's particularly fascinating, but the idea that she believed so wholeheartedly that what she did was apolitical just me. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't even know where to begin to have a conversation with her. And um, so Brian knows that what he does is totally politicized, you know. Yeah. He's not sort of naive like that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is, you know, this, so I think the representation is key, but making it better is not necessary. We're making it, um, yeah, somehow more able to capture the world won't solve the, yeah, mm -hmm. all these other issues that, that seem to be. So yeah, and I think what Brand is good at. I think just really yeah. quick. I think I think one thing that Brand is good at. One thing that Kelly Easterling is very good at. Um, one thing that, that you're very good at, Jeff, as a practitioner, yeah. is to uh, is to critique through the production of other scenarios, right? Like you're you're making scenarios, and that is another is another method by which critique proceeds, not just the sort of sarcastic, you know, oh, t go ahead and try and build this. Or, uh, but but to but to make to, to try to draw the world to continue to try to draw the world is necessary as well yeah. differently and and yeah mm -hmm. to, to try and draw other worlds. Mm -hmm. I think for me also in this 
conversation or representation. I, there is a sort of uh, pedagogical agenda for you, I think, Fred, and how I read it, which is that if there is a sort of a default attitude toward uh, how we understand images as ideological things, like we, we place it on the rendering. I, I, I think it's just a sort of default supposition. And I, I like the reversal um, in, in this reading that like maybe the rendering is the place where you can more easily locate the gaps than the diagrams, or right? the, the sort of all of these like kind of planning documents, which are you know full of the same sort of evidence of the, the world that produces them, but are less um, accessible. In that way. And I, I think that that for me is like part of the, the, the tweak that you're making of a contemporary proposition, which is the, the whole sort of, uh, kind of discourse around like the capitalist realist image and like it's, it's a very sort of straightforward um, uh, critique for us that I, I think you're kind of cooking a little bit. Mm -hmm. Any last really quick question that you want to put on the table before we <laughs> adjoin to uh, book sales? And, uh, <laughs> Beautiful book. I don't know. Strange <laughs> lion, isn't it? <laughs> Let's do this thing. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you.